Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I can't remember if my guy has seen me in this set or not. I don't think he has, but he's real into tits anyway, and this makes my tits look massive, so I'm going to wear it anyway. Here we go. This is the smaller bedroom. And this is the master bedroom of the upstairs. I'll be oiled up, and yeah. I'll be laying there. Okay. Everyone has their own opinion about what you're doing with your own body. Everyone has their own assumptions that you're here because you're broken or because you're damaged or because you've been forced to or because you have a drug habit. I'd go to my retail job where even though I had all the legal rights and everything, I had bosses taking advantage of me. I was being made to work hours more than I was supposed to. I was made to come in early and leave late. I was being paid terribly. And then you come back to the place where society has a problem with it, but it's the place that gives you everything that you should be getting from all these other places. Yeah, I'm here because I like having sex. I'm good at it. I like meeting people and I like making money and being respected. Like, I like people to leave feeling better about themselves when they come in. Oh, definitely. That's the number one mm. goal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I feel like it's like we've done our job well when our clients leave feeling much better than when they arrive. So this is where the ladies come to greet their clients. It's a really nice start to a booking as well. You know, the clients walk through the door, look up the stairs to see a beautiful woman. They think, woohoo, I'm about to spend time with her. Aren't I lucky? I love educating people about our wonderful model of decriminalisation in New Zealand. We get studied by the rest of the world. New Zealand seems to be the only country that has got it right, and that's because they consulted sex workers, whereas any other country doesn't talk to sex workers. They just make plans and laws for them without discussing it with them or caring about what they say. This end of the building has more massage rooms and a dungeon. So this is what we call a lounge dungeon. It's the most well-equipped dungeon in Wellington. It's the second most well-equipped professional dungeon in New Zealand. Full of all sorts of goodies and naughty little bits and pieces that you can, you know, make fantasies and things come alive for clients. So we have to sneak around in between the things. Cool. <laughs> He's lovely too. He always, he was always like, oh, I'm so lucky to see you. You look gorgeous every time. And it's real sweet. I'm real into edging him, and he, every time he'll he'll refuse to look at me because he because he finds it too much. He always tries to um, like touch me and tease me, but I make him wait until I've teased him first. I'm like, uh uh, it's not your turn yet, not your turn. Because you've done him. No, no, it's not coming out. <laughs> it is. I am a tease. Decriminalisation means that it is safe. To be a sex worker, it's safe to be a private sex worker, it's safe to be an agency owner. Sex workers have access to any services that any other person has access to. It doesn't mean that they won't be judged by the people that they're dealing with, but legally any department has to treat them the same as anybody else. So we're very, very aware of the fact that we are a very privileged bubble in the sex industry, but that doesn't mean that we're not trying to fight for the rights of others. Um, we're in the heart of Christchurch in Rickerton. Yeah, just in my little get up, my little space away from home, somewhere for me to come and relax and chill out. I grew up in um, Paris here, Poirier country, Party Mary Club. <laughs> I'm the third oldest of ten kids, and that's nine boys and one girl, or now two girls. And I tell my mother, she goes, oh, my son. I said, no, no, I'm your daughter now. <laughs> I'd always come past Christchurch, like I said, for like ten years. And I was like, I want to go and meet some of my sisters, you know, the queens, because you can go to any city and go meet queens, they're going to be somewhere. And I was like, I want to, you know, come up here, i got a motel. Um, Got dressed up one night and came out to Manchester to meet the girls. And, you know, we turn around the corner and I see these two queens standing there working. And Phoenix starts strutting his stuff down, you know, walking straight down, proud as can be. And I just come out with, hello, my sisters. <laughs> 
And I fucking went out and I just opened my arms and gave them a big cuddle and kiss. They're like, yeah, you neat. <laughs> the work is really, really, really slow out there. You don't understand, girlfriend. When you have a drug habit, you're dependent. You've got no free time for yourself. If you don't got a hundred dollars the next morning, you're fucking on your deathbed. Before I go out on the street, I have a shower and get my face ready. I'm doing my makeup and then find something to wear or decide what I'm going to wear before I go out. Put it all together and voila. Kind of made the joke before that sex work is basically just endless laundry. This is actually like incredibly reasonable for this place. Um, someone's clearly been pretty on top of it yesterday, but you will just wind up with like I mean these will be constantly running for about 12 hours a day. I feel like sex work is inherently really funny, but it's never funny for the reasons that people think it is. I had a client a couple of weeks ago who told me that he thought it was a real pity that we met in here because if I wasn't a sex worker he considered dating me, which was you know, quietly funny all on its own. Um, but it's mostly just those kind of like extremely dry, like sort of observational humour kind of things. Like the, that's, that's usually what makes the job funny. I feel like in a lot of ways, the sex that I have at work, the boundaries are better communicated than personal life sexual encounters. If you go out to a party or a bar and you take someone home, before you get home, you probably haven't gone through, like, we're going to do acts X, Y, and Z, but I'm not up for this, and also we're going to use condoms for everything. That's probably not a conversation that you're having sort of like three or four beers deep. Whereas all of my interactions with clients, I'm being very explicit about exactly which service they're booking for, what's included in that, what isn't included in that, what safer sex precautions are expected. It's communicated in, with much more clarity than it is in a lot of other sexual encounters. The phone collection situation. <laughs> I do two different kinds of work. I do full service and I also do fetish and domination. So I run different ads, different photos, different names and obviously different phones for both of those. When I say that I wake up in the morning and I check my phones, I mean like quite literally phones, plural. Inevitably, whenever your phones get busy, they will all get busy at the same time. So you'll have one ringing and you'll be texting off another and then someone will be messaging you on a third. So it does turn into this like, slightly ridiculous situation of just this kind of juggling between all of them. Because there is this kind of obsessive preoccupation with the sex, that means that if you put it on a CV, that is all someone is going to see. They're not going to see all of your administration skills, they're not going to see your ability to negotiate with clients, they're not going to see your time management skills, all they're going to see is the sexual labour. The sex is definitely not the most interesting part of it, and I feel like often this desire to talk about the sex is essentially used as a way to exceptionalise sex work and to justify kind of othering us. I have hands-on experience in the sex industry and I mean I don't know what NCPC did actually to be honest with you until um, I started volunteering with them. <laughs> yeah and this is Momo. She's my daughter from Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> I'd say I've probably been with them for 20 years. For me, people are so important, and it's, you know, the Māori proverb, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. You know, it's the people, the people, the people. And the people are really important in this work that we do here at the collective. People accept us, even though there's still stigma and discrimination. Two weeks ago, I mean, our national coordinator founder, Catherine Healy, became a dame, and, and for her to be recognised as a former sex worker is huge. I was incredibly touched um, to discover that I'd been nominated to be a dame. You know, when you've had a history as a sex worker, you feel othered in so many situations. You're not quite part of the right crowd, and it's been quite different to think, oh gosh, we really are being brought in from the cold. I think it's one of those things where we, you know, step forward a bit and we take a few knocks. We would like to see an end to discrimination and stigma. It's improved a lot. We would like to see, obviously, the change um, so that no sex worker who's been discriminated against because they're a sex worker.
I used to work at Merivale from a very nice townhouse until I was told to cease working by the council because it broke a bylaw. My front fence was graffitied about five times with obscene language um, explaining exactly what was going on inside and what my real name was. My car has been keyed. Neighbours have had letters written to them telling them what's going on, where, where I was living and what I was doing. Schools were notified as well. Harriet says hello to them all. Um, there's Harriet's little bed in the corner where she has her electric blanket to keep her warm. I tried to picture myself as an 80-year-old lady in a rest home, looking back on my life. And I thought, well, if you don't try it, you'll never find out. And I didn't want to get there and think, oh, you stupid girl. You know, because at that age, you probably look back and think, oh, that'd be nothing, you know. Um, and so I thought, well, I'm not getting any younger. Most of my clients are around my age and older. Mature, mostly sort of like business, self-employed people. Um, I've had the odd very young client, um, which you forget what they're like when they're that age. <laughs> I enjoy giving and I enjoy knowing that I can give that pleasure to them, but I get something out of it as well. I get the intimacy and the closeness and also the social contact. You know, I don't go out a lot, so that, that contact with other people um, and variety is really important to me too. Sex has sort of always been a bit taboo and a bit hush-hush, you know, you don't talk about it. But I know there are people out there who don't agree with what I do. I think a lot of problems started after the earthquakes when there was a known area in town where um, girls used to work and it was more business um, orientated. And then after the earthquakes, the whole city was closed off. Um, and so it, it moved out to the suburbs more. And this is our tree, this is our tree. We give it a hug every now and then. Yeah, this is our sacred tree. If we could reach it, we'd probably Isn't hang it? a rope from it. <laughs> <laughs> So I started working when I was 12 years old because my sister was a heroin addict, so she sold me for a few drugs when, she was, um, when I was 12. And that sort of got me my steps in. Always thing I learned was from 12 was to dress provocatively or to be a hooker. I had no, I had no stand of what normality was then, I really wanted to fit in. I see society and the way they look, and I think, oh, I just want to look like them. And I still struggle with that now, like, so what will I become? There's no way I want to get lost here. But I am a bit lost. My car come down here and I just have this instant connection with them. So, and they go, oh, girl. I go, oh, girl. So, and they just say, I don't know, we know each other's journeys now. Whatever we've got going on at home, you come out here and we know each other. But I can say, working with all these girls, I mean, it's a privilege to know that they're just as fucked up as me. When I first started out here, I'd come out and I'd be out here for about half an hour and I'd say, I want to go home. And my friends would turn around and say, fuck up, bitch. <laughs> you don't know nothing. You handle it. You've got to stay out here till the morning. And yeah, like, all night. Till 10 o'clock the next morning. If you needed to make what you needed to make. Yeah, this does not work like they used to be. You used to come out and make, you know, two, three, four hundred dollars a night. Now you're lucky if you make 60 dollars. It's 40 for a hand job, 60 for a blow job, um, hundred dollars up for sex. I don't know, some of them like 60, 80. Just really whatever they can get. Everyone's broken, struggling. <laughs> you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> when you meet those those rough guys that just think you're just that piece of the fucking shit and you know, they get rough with you. Like I've actually taken one down the road and he's given me twenty dollars and expected sex and I was like, no, sorry about it. And then walking back, and he's just come up and sideswiped me in the face, like with a rock or whatever he had. And I was like, oh my God, you just always got to be on your guard. I just want to get myself sorted, and I want to get it off the drugs altogether, not be on the methadone as a box home. And soon enough, I want to go home and go and look after my mum. Everyone's getting older, and it's like, yeah. I want to go home and look after them. I don't want to miss out on my mum. I love it. So I deal with all the street ladies and that. Well, it's a lot more dangerous. 
it's a lot harder, it's a lot colder, yeah. But since the quakes, the whole of the sex industry got totally displaced. Parlors, uh, there was about 10 or so and there's none now. So the whole area here was cordoned off and I've never heard the street so quiet. I've got more fish coming from the raisin roll, the gone. Uh, the decriminalisation law uh, changed a lot of things. It was 18th century law made by men, for men, I might add. Everyone's got issues. You walk into an office, there's probably a couple of people that have got drug issues there or alcohol issues, um, but it's not talked about so much because it's not sex work, you know, so the sex industry always gets more stigma than most other jobs. I understand the issues that we have, uh, the girls have, society has. I just think they're good girls. I do worry sometimes that this desire to present particular sectors of the industry as doing really well inherently happens by pushing down others. This kind of, oh, but I'm one of the good sex workers because X, Y and Z, because I don't see too many clients because I charge a lot of money. And, and that by doing that, you're inherently shaming workers who work in high volume parlours maybe, or who can't charge as much money, or who don't have the same ability to decline clients. It's the same job whether you're seeing two clients a week or 10 clients a night. One of those workers is not better or more acceptable than the other. Unless you start paying attention to who that stigma is attached to and why, it becomes very difficult to improve conditions across the board in the industry.